Okay, everybody, welcome to class. Today, we're going to continue our lesson about the growth of the city or urbanization in America. Now, as the United States grows in industry, the cities grow as well. And we talked about this a little bit, but cities grow in two different directions, outwards and upwards, okay? As more and more people move to the city, you have to have to find places for these people to live. And so different cities develop differently because of the geography around those cities. For example, New York City becomes famous for extremely tall skyscrapers, which are made possible through the stronger steel that we talked about last week, through the Bessemer process. But New York City, part of why it becomes so full of skyscrapers is it's an island. And as an island, there's not that much land available. And so the cost-benefit analysis tells people that it's cheaper to build tall buildings that have smaller footprints than large sprawling buildings with wide footprints because of the price of land. In other places like Chicago, which is much more open and less constricted by geography, you see that city has tall buildings in the center, but it's much more of a sprawling city. One of my favorite historians is this guy named William Cronin. He is a very famous environmental historian, and he writes a lot about how humans have shaped the environment, how the environment has shaped humans, okay, and how history, a lot of history is the interaction between people and the natural world. And even in big cities where you think nature is almost like extinct, except for like in parks, nature has an influence on major cities. And so Chicago, he wrote this book about nature's metropolis. Chicago becomes very quickly one of the fastest growing cities in America because it's seen as kind of like the gateway to the west and to the east. If you look at geography, up until the advent of railroads, waterways tended to be the best source of transportation. So most of our major cities in America were on the coast, okay? Places like New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Baltimore, and those cities, if they were attached to a navigable river, were even more prosperous. Part of why New York is so, so prosperous is not just the fact that it's on the Atlantic Ocean, but it's also on the bay of the Hudson River. And so the Hudson River is a navigable river. That means you can sail boats down it, and you can get all the way into the interior of New York. Last semester, we talked about how people dug man-made waterways or canals, like the Erie Canal, which connected the Hudson River to Lake Erie. And once you connect to the Great Lakes, then you're able to connect New York City with all the ports around the Great Lakes, like Cleveland, okay, and, or Detroit, or Chicago. Now, Chicago is pretty far west on the Great Lakes. And once Chicago gets railroads back and forth to the west, it becomes a hub of transportation, okay? Lots and lots of people heading west or in the Great Plains are connected to the city of Chicago. And as the country grows, as resources are sent to Chicago and products are sent out from Chicago, it grows dramatically. We looked at like the, on the PowerPoint last, uh, yesterday, we looked at how it just like grew like 17 sizes. And it was like multiplied by I think 17 times in about you know 30, 30 to 50 years. So it's dramatic the growth okay, in a place like Chicago. And this happens all across the country. But these cities around the Great Lakes and on this Midwest, this junction between the old East Coast and the new Western society, this grows very, very quickly. And we get an industrial hub around the Great Lakes. Today, it's referred to as the Rust Belt, but that's because those industrial hubs have declined because of globalization, but we're not there yet. Around, right around the year 1900, these places are having their heyday. They are growing, they are thriving, and things are going well, okay? The country is moving westward, and it's like, it's, it feels like, like vessels of blood. You know how like your body has a heart and it pumps blood and it goes out the arteries and back through the veins. It's like the railroads are those veins and the heart is the city pumping in and out. And then the rest of the body parts are, you know, out. this is a bad metaphor, but like, you know, you have resources and nutrients coming in, things coming out and then back and forth and back and forth. And the whole country is becoming increasingly interconnected, okay? 
to a point that leads to these massive sprawling cities, but they're not like islands. They depend upon farms and they depend upon all these rural areas outside the city. And there's a mutual interdependence between cities and the countryside. Okay, now, steel is a foundational technology to having any industrial revolution. In fact, most of the factories and much of the jobs of the industrial revolution center around in some way steel. You're building railroad, they're making out of steel. You're building bridges, you're using steel. You're building buildings, skyscrapers made with steel. Steel is great because it can bend, but it's very strong and it's also lighter than say bricks, okay? You can make a brick building pretty tall, but bricks are so heavy and they're not very bendy. And so when you have something that's really tall that's made out of bricks, it's very possible for it to sway in the wind and collapse and break, okay? Yeah. And now the leaning tower piece, I think that has to do with its foundation and it's like stabilized in a weird way to where it's not gonna fall over. But if you ever go up in a really tall skyscraper building and you watch it, the building will wobble. And that's a good thing. Because if it was rigid, it would break. Okay, if something bends, it'll bend, but then it'll snap back. Okay, and it's not gonna like collapse. So it's better to have something that can bend than to break. If you look at some of the big steel bridges or suspension bridges in the world, you'll see those things will move. Okay, like when the wind hits them just right, they'll move. And in fact, there's a concept in physics called the natural frequency, which is like the exact frequency of waves that has to hit something to make it uh, undulate in a certain pattern. Anyways, it microwaves do it with water. Microwaves send out waves of, of energy at the exact perfect frequency that causes water to just start vibrating until it boils, okay? That's why a microwave, you could like, it doesn't get hot, but water boils in it. And that's because it's hitting the natural frequency of water, okay? It's, it's weird. That's why, that's why also microwaves have like that little like shield on them, like, you know, there's a little grid on it. That's because that's the size of a microwave. And so anything, if it had bigger holes, the microwaves would really get out and, you know, could fry stuff. But you can actually hit bridges. You can look up bridges being hit by wind at like the natural frequency. And all of a sudden the bridges will just start doing this thing. They'll just like, just like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yes. And uh, look it up. Uh, it's a real thing. And anyways, but most of the time, bridges are designed to sway a little bit. And that's because it'd be better if it swayed than if it just collapsed. And so you're able to build things like massive bridges, like the Brooklyn Bridge and others that allow for more and more transportation, bigger cities, more efficiency, okay? People can live in different parts of the area around New York and like get back and forth using the bridges and it can make the economy more efficient, okay? And this also creates a lot of jobs in construction. One fun fact, it's not really the most exciting thing, but the Brooklyn Bridge, when they were making it, they were having a horrible problem with like people falling off and dying while they were working on it. And eventually they put a net underneath the Brooklyn Bridge, to, like catch workers if they fell so they wouldn't die. But actually the number of people that like fell once they put the net up, like decreased. Because, many people believe, that because since the workers knew that they had a safety net to protect them, they were like more relaxed and less jumpy. You know, if, the, if you're, when you're freaking out, like if I make one mistake, I'm going to die, and then you're freaking out, then you actually might make a mistake more easily. So, anyways, just a little tidbit. There's not like, take whatever meaning you want from that, you know, but uh, it's good to have security. Okay. Oh, elevators are important. Okay. You really don't get big skyscrapers until you start figuring out how to do elevators. And so they make, they make it possible for a lot of these buildings to function. Does anyone know what this building is or where it is? Uh, this is in New York. This is, I forget what the exact name of this building is, uh, but it is on Times Square, okay? And so that's one of the early skyscrapers. Today, this building is like covered in billboards. And this is Times Square, New York, but back in the Gilded Age. <laughs> Of it today? Yes, please. So like today before and after. Yes. So look, so 
This is this is the building in Spider Man where the Daily Bugle is, but I know that that's not in reality. A triangle building on Times Square. What's a building called? The Flatiron Building. That's the Flatiron Building. Today, it's um, that's it. Back in the day, today it's like covered in, or there's billboards all around it. Okay, this Times Square. We'll just look at Times Square in New York. Yeah, it's a little busy now. That's not the opposite end. I think that actually, it might be that the Flatiron Building doesn't have billboards. That's the other. That's the other perspective. We're look. This is like from Flatiron. Okay, so they don't have as many. Uh, that the billboards must be on the other side. Oh well. The billboard, that must be, this view must be you standing at Flatiron, and then this view must be the other way around looking at Flatiron. But anyways, it's still there. All right. So, there you go. It's changed a lot, but in many ways, the city is exciting. And these marvels of technology are really fascinating to behold. And for people that are well off, living in the city is really nice. But for every nice building there is, there's a lot of places that are not so nice. And the cities become infected or become filled with the slums. So, how's it going, Dr. Barrett? There you go. All right, so as the city grows and develops, we see a disparity between like, extremely prosperous and average ordinary people. Like we talked about factory working conditions. A lot of people, they would, were able to find places to live and places to stay, but they found places to stay in things called tenements, okay? So tenement, I don't know how to spell that. This is my college class, by the way, Dr. Darby. Tenement, spelled T-N-E-M-E-N-T, -E okay? A tenant, that's exactly, that's the root word. It's a rental property. And a tenant lives in a tenement, okay? And the landlord owns the tenement, okay? It's like tenants are people who rent property. But tenements in the Gilded Age are typically thought of as, we don't think of them just as like a rental apartment, okay? When you hear the word tenement and you think about the Gilded Age, the connotation is a crowded apartment where typically with multiple families in the same dwelling, okay? A lot of times to make rent, several different families might rent the same like apartment area and you might have such a crowded situation where there might be only one or two like kitchens or bathroom facilities in one floor of an apartment and it was common to see things where say you have three or four single guys that share an apartment the guy who works the day shift and the guy who works the night shift they may share the same bed and just like rotate one guy's at work the other guy sleeps one guy they come back from work the other guy goes to work and they, you know, they use the same bed, they use the same room, they use the same facilities because they're so crowded. And that's partially because of supply and demand. We talked about this before. When the supply of good is high, when the supply of good is high and the demand is low, then the price of that good is low, okay? So there's a lot of people in New York City or in Chicago, there's not a lot, as much demand for workers. So the wages for those workers is going to be low. But if we flip it and we have high demand, there's all these people that need a place to stay, but it takes a while to build all the buildings for them. So the supply is going to be low. What's going to be the price? What's the price of an apartment going to be? It's going to be high. It's going to be expensive. Okay. So because you're gonna be seeing all these crowded apartments and all these crowded cities. It takes a long time to build all the housing for them. And there's just simply not enough. Have a good day, Dr. Bauer. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And if there's not enough, it's gonna be expensive. And you're gonna to have to have situations where people are sharing, okay? And so we have the slums. These slums are typically crowded. They're typically nasty. They're typically places where you see a lot of disease. You have all these, they're not social distancing, okay? All right, you see all these people crowded on top of each other, okay? It's easy for diseases to spread. Also, remember, this is a time whenever working conditions aren't that great. 
So if you're sick, it's not like you can get paid time off. So a lot of times people, when they're sick, they can't afford to go to a doctor. They just keep going to work. And so that can lead to spread. This is also a period of time when crime is really, is more is common and easy to do because you're so crowded, it's easy to get lost in a crowd. Okay? If people tend to be worse in big crowds. People tend to be worse people in big crowds. Because there's this ability to lose yourself in a crowd and do bad things. That's why, like, average ordinary people don't just go up to Target and, like, steal televisions. But when you're in a big crowd of people and everybody else is doing it, you can do it too, okay? You can slip away in the crowd. There's also not enough social services, okay? A lot of these cities grow so fast, and their fire departments don't grow at the same speed. Chicago has a nasty, nasty fire right around the turn of the same street. Like this apparently was caused by a cow kicking like a gas lantern. Okay, but this fire burns down basically almost all of Chicago. Okay, and lots of people die and they have to rebuild the city almost from scratch. But part of the problem was they didn't really have a good enough fire department. Okay, there's not enough police departments, there's not enough sewage systems. Okay, I'm on the city council of Como. All right, and so I have a little bit of understanding how this works. Okay. When people poo and they flush things down the toilet, it's got to go somewhere. When people drink water, it's got to come from somewhere. And you don't want to just have, you have to have enough water, enough sewage to match the demand for the town, okay? It's easy to have people move in. It's harder to upgrade your sewer system, okay? So sometimes people who live outside the city of Como, they want to get on Como water. And if they do, usually sometimes the city will say no, because we don't want to like use up all the water for the people living in the city of Como for people who live outside the city of Como. And if someone who lives outside the city of Como gets water from the city of Como, we usually charge them double because you know they don't pay city taxes. If you live in the city, you pay the taxes, so you know you get the water cheaper. Anyways, but listen, like that's an issue. And in big cities, it's even more important. How do you create sewer systems? water systems, fire departments, police departments that match the rapidly growing size of cities. Okay, Chicago like grows by 17 times. There you need 17 times as much social services, okay? And those don't really exist. They don't grow as fast, okay? So life in the city isn't always fun and nice. And you know it's got to stink because a lot of these places, they have very limited indoor plumbing, okay? And so there's jobs like the night soil people who like, so what do you do? You go to the bathroom, right? You're like, you're laying in bed, you gotta go to the bathroom, okay? There's no toilet, or if there is a toilet, there's only one on the whole floor. So it's very common to have a chamber pot, okay? Which is like a little bucket under your bed that you do your business in, yeah. okay? In the morning, you gotta take care of the stuff that you did. There's different options. Some buildings might have like a basement or like a repository where you dump your stuff. Some people might just throw it out the window, okay? Um, there was a job, like, you know how there's garbage men? There were night soil gatherers and night soil people, okay? So night soil people would come by buildings, you know, early in the morning and collect their poop. And then they would go and, you know, put it places, I guess, people might use it for different things. There's uses for poop. But anyways, you know, there are people that, like, that was their job. They had to gather it up before you, because that's something that you might do if you don't have adequate like plumbing, okay? Now, over time, they do catch up, but there's a period of time where it's pretty nasty. That's part of why, you know, if a man and a woman are walking down the street, the man is supposed to walk closer to the road and the woman is supposed to walk clo closer to like, you know, the houses or the yard or whatever. Because, you know, a lot of times the poop stuff would like just collect in like the ditches or, you know, you've got a period of time where there's horse-drawn wagons still being drawn across the city, you know, horses poop, okay? If a cart or something comes by and it splashes poop water, the man chivalrously is supposed to, you know, take the hit. And the woman does, you know, that's the idea, right? So. Do you think they ever got poop, like, thrown on them? I'm sure that it has happened. Um, I don't have, like, a specific example, but I'm sure that it happened. Anyways, so. <laughs> All right, summon. Now, this picture, I have debated taking it just off the PowerPoint because in the past, I've taught this lesson about the Gilded Age and kids will write essays like, the Gilded Age was bad because people were always putting their babies in cages. And that's not the point. 
Not everyone did this, okay? But <laughs> when you're crammed up in an apartment all day long, and your kids are crammed in an apartment all day long, and it's steamy, and it's hot, there's not air conditioning, okay? And it's stuffy, okay? And you want your kid to get fresh air, but you're stuck in the city all the time, you know, and it, you'd have to climb down 20 flights of stairs to take your kids for a walk outside. Why not get a little cage thing and let little Johnny get some fresh air, okay? Right? Not everyone did this, okay? This is actually something probably people did if they actually had a little extra money. So like your average poor person probably wouldn't buy a baby cage, okay? In the past, I've taught this lesson. It's like the only thing kids remember. And so like when they write their essays about like what was the Gilded Age like or whatever, they'll be like, yeah, people were throwing their babies in cages outside, but listen, it looks safe. And we've got some straps. Like the like little Johnny's having a great time. Okay. He's got some fresh air. He's outside of that smelly hot apartment. He's got his nice warm business coat looking thing on. And he's just enjoying nature. Okay. Like when you have kids, don't coop. Don't cook them up all inside all day. They need kids need sunlight and air, fresh air. You know, open a window. Let them go outside. Baby. What do you mean? Um, I only see Delaine outside when I pass your house. Oh, by his little creek. He like he likes being outside. It's a, it's a good. Spot. I imagine you like that. That little creek we call that the ravine, um, which is actually technically not a ravine. My mother, she always called it a ravine, I guess to be like poetic and exciting. But an actual ravine is like a deep crevice that like people can die in if they fall in. But it's like just a little ditch. But we always called it the ravine. And growing up, I thought ravines were just little ditches. And every now and then that would cause confusion when I would call something a ravine. And they're like, that's not a ravine. And then there's a book called The Bridge to Terabithia. Okay, the girl in the story, spoiler alert, dies falling in a ravine. And as a kid, like, that doesn't make sense. It's like, <laughs> I never stand up. But actual ravines are like, <laughs> anyways, just a weird little thing. All right, we're running a little bit low on time, but, but basically, life in the city, for people that are well off, is pretty nice. But for a lot of people, their living arrangements were squalor, just getting by, Okay. It may be if everybody in the family works and you share an apartment with another family that's nice, you might be able to afford to pay rent every month and take care of your basic needs. But if just a few things go wrong, you might end up out on the street in some kind of shack, just barely scraping by. Okay. All right. Tomorrow, I want to teach y'all all about political machines. And so try to see what you can learn about it. We're going to stop now because I know y'all are about to go to your big, uh, you're, yeah, we'll stop there.